Hello. Hello, everyone um, who's joined us virtually as well, who has joined us um, in person to today's lunchtime seminar uh, at the Center for Print Research here from W Block in uh, French by uh, UE Campus. Uh, welcome to Caroline Whitsum and uh, Susanna Klein, who will be uh, leading the, Korean, uh, the question and answer session afterwards. Um, this session is recorded uh, for those of you who'd like to um, listen back to all our recordings. You can see those at cfbr.ue.ac.uk. Uh, um, my name is Frank Menga. I just want to welcome Karen Witsum. And without further uh, great ado, I'd like to just invite Karen onto the stage and uh, thank you for uh, her presentation for today. So, Karen, can you join us at the, on the stage, please? There you go. There's lots of rattling going on at the moment. Can you hear me now? Can we hear? Can we hear you? Can you hear me? Can you say there's not something else? Uh, can you hear me? Does it work? Right, we can hear you not very well, but we can sort of hear you here. Everyone in the room should be able to in the virtual room could should be able to hear you as well, mine. Okay, I would just talk a bit louder. Okay, that's so, that's actually very good. Come as close to the microphone as possible. So yes, we'll do. Okay, come on, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Frank. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to talk about my work today. Apologies in advance if my voice should get a little crackly or if I start coughing. In between, I suffered from a very bad cold, and I'm still in the process of recovering. So, <laughs> just so you know. Um, I will share my screen now. <clears throat> right. So, I am an interdisciplinary artist. I am working with performance, installation, textiles and sound. In 2020, I graduated from my BA in Contemporary Arts Practice at Bafspa University and got awarded with a graduate fellowship at Spike Island in Bristol. The fellowship only recently ended and ran alongside a three-month residency with Somerset Film. I'm currently developing works between Austria, that's where I'm originally from, and the UK. My current practice explores themes around the evolution, philosophy and symbolism of plants, ethnobotanical studies and ancient farming methods. Like I said, I'm, I'm really pleased to talk about my current practice today and introduce my ongoing research project titled From Soil to Weave, as well as Endling, my most recent work developed as part of my research and during my three-month residency. So, it all started in November 2020 when being introduced to a creative community on a farm in Somerset. It was once a truly awful place, an industrial chicken farm, um, but it could now turn into a creative hub. So it houses artist studio spaces and regularly houses events, small gatherings and simply a place to share ideas and exchange skills. So this was a shot I took um, during summer at the farm. We have a big vegetable garden here um, and are just making spaces are housed in this corridor and a hundred meter long barn where we, um, during COVID last year, we had a, a drive-through exhibition, which was quite a unique thing. At this point, it might be worth mentioning my background in bespoke tailoring. So before moving to the UK in 2017, I completed my first degree and I visited a traditional Viennese school for tailoring and got trained in fabricating clothes by hand. We had textile chemistry classes where we burnt fibers in order to analyze whether it's a plant um, or animal fiber or whether it's a man-made, thus artificial fiber. By inspecting the smell, color and consistency of the remains, we had to analyze. So I got also trained in uh, pattern making, traditional weaving, embroidery and all sorts of other textile techniques. 
I think this, or oh, I'm almost convinced that this former training forms the base of my current practice and probably everything I do beyond that. I got trained to be extremely patient, especially when it comes to my work. And I developed an eye and a sense for materiality and the quality of things. It was almost a, a scientific exploration of textiles. Being of highly curious nature, I've always been fascinated by the thought of, of growing my own materials, of understanding where the materials come from, what processes a raw material is going through until I can work with it. Um, rather than buying a ready-made product in the shop, I simply wanted to understand and physically experience what it means to So, to hard physical labour, it requires a routine and a rhythm. It has something about, about caring and taking on responsibility, forming an understanding, quite literally, from soil to weave, through physical action and engagement. It is learning by doing and thereby creating a deep understanding of the material. So this is the patch of land I was offered to work with on the farm and it is situated in South Somerset. The field is, as you can see, is surrounded by willows, brambles, nettles and moss and to just name the most present plants. Surrounded by a thicket of bramble, the field is perfectly sheltered from the wind, which is important when it comes to cultivate flax. I've been working with this pre-cut area, which was needed to turn agricultural uh, vehicles. So this is it, the field that forms the base of my research. Thankfully, I had huge support when it came to prepare the ground, digging out roots of bramble, nettles, tons of bindweed, and many, many others. Rotating the soil, raking and evening it out. This is the pile of uh, bramble roots um, that you can see here. Extraordinary things, really. They almost look like, like mandrakes or little creatures themselves. Um, yeah, so I harvested various types of mosses, gathered nettle and bramble roots, which will all be used for future works. I've started to make natural inks from nettle and bramble roots and will develop a series of natural dyes from the harvested moss. Processing and making use of everything the field provides is one of the many aspects I started this research project. To work with the seasons and harvesting the material, the materials as the, the project progresses and the months um, go by. So I started analyzing the soil by measuring levels of nutrients such as nitrogen, uh, potassium or phosphorus. The soil uh, I was dealing with was not very ideal for flux. However, I still wanted to go ahead and see it as a sort of field experiment. Um, flux prefers a loamy soil, however, it is highly adaptable and grows in very different climates and soil conditions. Um, so I was very positive. Uh, the preparations um, continued by applying organic fertilizers such as llama manure and homemade fertilizers made from nettle and seaweed. Llama manure was used to loosen up the soil and make it lighter and thus reducing the chance of, of water logging, which is quite fatal for flax plants. And llama manure is, is, is a very rich source of nutrients, um, such as nitrogen, um, phosphorus, um, even magnesium. And nitrogen is very important for plant growth. And phosphorus helps plants to convert other nutrients into important building blocks. Um, whereas potassium, or commonly known as pot ash, increases the root growth and thus makes it uh, quite strong um, if facing drought. So this image shows the flax field approximately 10 to 14 days after sowing the seeds. And as you can see in the photographs, I've divided the, the field into four different patches, applying different fertilizers in each patch and also different ways of sowing the seeds. 
in the front left patch, for example, I, I uh, the seeds were sown in rows with a gap of 20 centimeters. Uh, in the other three patches, uh, the seeds were sown more densely and some in wider rows and others in circular patches. Um, yeah, so some seeds were, were kind of distributed by hands, whereas the others were raked in evenly. So at this point, it might be worth telling a bit more about the flux plant itself. So flux is an annual plant and producing so-called bust fibers, meaning the fibers come from the stem, which run from the root of the plant to the tip. The Latin word for flux is linum usitatissimum. Linum comes from the Greek word linon, which is a root word and forms the base of many other words, whereas usitatissimum translates as most useful and thus refers to linen being a most useful textile. The characteristics of flux give linen its exceptional properties, um, such as its strength, its ability to regulate temperature and conduct heat, as well as being extremely water absorbent. After all, linen is considered to be the second strongest natural fiber after silk, which is quite extraordinary from such a delicate plant. And the difference between flux and linen is flux refers to the plant and the unprocessed fiber, whereas linen refers to the processed fiber and woven fabric. So the history and the philosophy of plants form a major interest within my current practice. While there are many plants being cultivated for their fibers, it is flux that interests me the most. Flux is probably one of the most ancient cultivated crops for two reasons, the seeds and the fiber. So early humans were seed gatherers, so it seems very likely that uh, the flux plant first caught their uh, attention for the seeds. Um, it's not only rich in nutrients, um, it's edible, um, but can also be pressed into linseed oil, which has many, many uses today, such, um, such, as, a uh, such as a preservative for wood or concrete, apologies, um, um, a preservative for wood or concrete, as well ingredient in paints, varnishes and stains. Additionally, linseed oil is used in inks, soaps and in the production of linoleum. So it is thought that weaving preceded um, spinning. So early humans may have recognized the exceptional properties of flux stalks, being incredibly flexible and tough. So they may have used it for um, to use it for uh, to make fishing nets or fishing traps or even windbreaks. Um, so through continuous exposure to the elements like uh, moisture, wind and sunshine, the outer bag of the stalks would have rotted and thus revealing the shiny fibers underneath it. Northern France, Belgium and Holland have long been famous for fine quality flax and still continue to grow it. But it's countries like Russia, Canada um, and China who are growing um, most of the flax today. Egypt was once so very famous for fine quality flax, but it is now one of the smallest contributors to the, to the world market. And at the beginning of the 17th century, one out of six agricultural laborers in Europe would be involved in either growing or processing flax. So homespun linen production continued through the early 1800s, but wayne as textile production became more industrialized, especially with the invention of cotton, with the cotton chain in 1793, I think. Um, so cotton, cotton production became more economical and took over rapidly. And then also at the beginning of the 20th century, when artificial fibers got introduced, um, flax got more and more forgotten or undervalued. Um, so, of course, it's a very, you know, it's a very rare knowledge today. Um, 
knowing how to cultivate flux and how to process it. But thankfully, more and more initiatives start working with flux again, community project projects raising awareness, which can only be a very good thing. <clears throat> so there are basically two types of flux, the fiber flux and the seed or linseed flux, with many different varieties for each type. There are differences between growing and harvesting flux and uh, fiber and seed flux. So fiber flux grows between 80 and 120 centimeters. So basically a much taller plant than seed flux, which only grows between 60 and 80 centimeters. Um, so it is the size of the plant that determines the length of the fiber. And fiber flux is sown um, so close together so that the stems grow straight and the plants develop as few branches as possible and this obviously guarantees the maximum fiber length. So sowing is usually done in spring after the cold winter months and the growing period is about three months up to 100 days by which the lower parts of the plants started or start to turn yellow. So the seeds should be a little underripe when being harvested and most often farmers or growers would leave a small patch fully ripen so to have seeds for the next season. <coughs> These are just a few pressed specimens um, from my flux field. I've been documenting them um, and kind of pulling out um, 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 plants from each from each patch every week just to um, yeah to investigate the the root development and the growth of the flux. So once pulled, the flux is being gathered in in bundles and dried for about two weeks. This is the drying period, either outdoors or, or indoors. This depends on the weather, obviously. And flux fibers are attached to a woody stem to the woody stem of the plant by natural pectins. So dissolving these pectins is an essential um, task to extract the fibers from the stem without breaking them. So this is when a process called retting comes in. There are different types of retting such as dew, water or the chemical retting process. Um, I've been working with dew retting not only because it's um, the environmentally most friendly version but it doesn't require any water or much water um, such as water retting which in addition pollutes water as well um, and another factor um, of the water retting is the smell so um, water retting is quite a smelly business uh, right so as you can see in the image this was an analog shot I took a few weeks well, a few months back now. Um, so the flux is laid out thinly in the field and exposed to dew and sunshine. And the more dew, the quicker the process. Um, yeah, so retting requires moisture. A combination of rain, dew and sufficient sunshine is ideal for microorganisms to break down the pectins. And it is during the retting process that the flux um, receives its natural beige color. And dew-retted flux is often darker than water-retted flux, which is often, which has often quite a blonde color. And after the retting is done, and I think to judge when the retting is done is quite an intuitive thing, and only which only experience can bring, really. Um, so once the retting is done, the flux is taken indoors and tried, and waiting for further progressing. <coughs> So um, here, this is where I am at the moment. The flux has been grown, harvested, and is now awaiting further processing. Further processing includes breaking, scutching, heckling, spinning, and weaving. I think it would expand the, the length of the seminar to go into much detail here, but I think each, each process or each technique is a, is a chapter for itself. Um, so once these tasks are done, um, the spinning and weaving begins and traditionally, traditionally known as, as the winter tasks. So um, once life would move indoors again, 
um, growers would kind of focus on, on the spinning and weaving tasks. And I quite like this idea of, of dividing specific tasks into, into seasons and dividing them into um, and, and kind of, yeah, kind of this division of tasks. Um, it has something so very, so very grounding and it forms a development, uh, it forms an awareness that I wish to bring into my practice, this kind of environmental awareness of working with the seasons, of working with a year cycle, is something I very much um, support in my practice. Um, so this brings me on to the making of my latest work, which I've developed as part of my ongoing research and as a part of my three-month residency with Sunset Film. Um, which run from July to September this year. So the work is titled Endling, and it's a digital work comprising 4K footage, thermography, and sound. The residency accompanied this research project for a certain period of time, and <clears throat> thus provides a window into a much, much longer process. So, developed during the flowering stage of the flux, Endling represents a point within this growing cycle and is concerned with its wider ecological impact and interconnectedness with the insect world. I've been documenting and recording day and nighttime visitors over a few weeks period. However, the footage for Endling was shot in a single night. I have been curious to find out what insects are attracted by the plant plants while being in full flower, what is it the flux provides to, um, to other li living beings beyond myself? Is it nutrition? Is it shelter? Is it a meeting point? How does the cultivation sit within its wider surrounding? And in what way does it contribute to enrich the biodiversity of the site and surrounding area? The work's title reference reference is a term used to describe the last known individual of a lineage, species or subspecies. Um, I came across the term endling in an article that I've recently read and it has fascinated me since. And the interesting thing is that the word endling exists in German as well and is which with the exact same meaning. So once an endling dies, a lineage of species becomes extinct. Um, just a few numbers here, which I think are quite important to become aware of. So in the UK alone, we have um, more than 27,000 insect species, such as butterflies, bees, beetles, dragonflies, moths, amongst many others. Insects are so very crucial for the functioning of our world and they are responsible for the pollination of most of our food crops, breaking down and recycling materials, as well as providing an essential food source for other animals. However, recent evidence suggests that the global number of insects may have decreased by 50% or more since 1970, and 41% of insect species are currently threatened with extinction. So, I would now I'd like to show you an extract of the film and even if I can't show you the entire film I would like to present you um, the beginning of the film and the team at Somerset Film and I are currently in the process of finding venues um, to present the film and accompanying research so there will certainly be a time to see the work in its full length. An endling describes the last known individual of a lineage, species or subspecies. Once the endling dies, the species or lineage becomes extinct.
It is quarter to midnight, a late summer Sunday. Temperatures between 14 and 15 degrees Celsius. Humidity 91%. Wind arriving from the south, southeast with a speed of 3.86243 km per hour. I can hear you all around me. So I have been using digital media to document various aspects, focusing on sound, thermal imaging and film. The setup in the field consisted of LED lights, um, a white sheet of fabric um, and a handmade moth trap. And after all the hard work that uh, went into the making of the moth trap, not a single moth paid a visit. So, well, flowering flux probably was more interesting than the moth trap. So I have to confess that I've been very lucky when it came to shoot the footage for Endling, as the weather forecast for this very night didn't look good at all. They had forecast rain, however, um, I still went ahead and laid cables from across the barn through the willow forest, through um, two meter high nettles, um, and yeah, so 120 meters in total and everything went well, thankfully. So, as part of the project, I created a library of, of insect sounds, starting from lace wings, crane flies and house flies, to mosquitoes, dragonflies, and larger nocturnal moths. <coughs> I've been experimenting with a range of microphones from contact, shotgun, and radio microphone, which turned out to be the most successful, especially if being amplified in a metal saucepan, like you can see in the image. <coughs> Apologies. I've used LED lights to attract the insects and to not harm them, obviously. Some of the recorded but sounds were embedded and not digitally manipulated to become part of the work, whilst others were used uh, will be used for future works to come. And the sound you, you heard in Endling is a combination of spoken word, field recordings, insect and digitally manipulated sounds. I've been working with a thermal camera, a device capable of detecting temperatures between minus 40 and 330 degrees Celsius <coughs> by capturing different levels of infrared light. I'm hugely interested in insects' thermal regulation, especially in connection to wider contexts such as climate change, the changing season, seasons, as well as the behavioural differences between um, day and nighttime insects. So while many insects are so-called ectotherms, um, which are animals whose seed sources prim primarily from the environment, others are endotherms. Um, these are animals that can produce heat internally through a biochemical process. And these insects don't produce heat through their entire body, but rather in specific parts of their bodies. For instance, moths, like in this image, uh, produce heat in their chest prior to flight, while the lower body remains fairly cool. I've been documenting the weather conditions every single day since planting the seeds in early summer. More than 100 days record of wind directions and speed, average temperature 
um, and level of humidity. One of the calmest nights turned out to be the one where I shot the footage for Endling. It was so incredibly still, um, almost surreal. Um, a still night with only the slightest sense of movements created by the insects themselves. Um, I remember the moment when I started filming, a little impatient. I was waiting for something to happen until I said to myself, wait, you know, you have to turn, you have to slow down and, and, and kind of adjust your perception. So often I get frustrated how very limiting our vision is, how little we actually see from these miniature worlds. And, and yeah, so once looking through the viewfinder of my camera, a whole new world opened up and I could investigate the insects throughout the night. Hours went past and yeah. So yeah, I think my patience got tested a little because um, at some point I was waiting two hours for a moth to move um, and this was one of the shots you didn't see now in the, in, in the film but um, which I included so yeah so it's all about slowing down our perception and turning in, tuning into this other world we are so dependent on so adapting to the speed and mode of insects how often these miniature worlds get neglected which are so very important for the ecosystem and the functioning of the world we wouldn't be here without these insects. Not only, yeah, like I said, not only do they perform as recyclers, breaking down materials, pollinating most of our food crops, but also providing a food source for other creatures. <clears throat> so globalized intensive farming methods in the production of fiber are making a significant contribution to this decline. Um, through the clearing of habitats, the use of, of chemical herbicides and pesticides, and um, the pollution of waters. My research project from Soul to Weave explores a more sustainable method of fiber production, whilst Endling exemplifies a symbiotic relationship pretty, between production and a wider ecology. So my research will continue and I am aiming to start another growing cycle next spring. And in the meantime, I'll be busy processing the flux and all the other harvested treasures. So, yeah, I hope I could give you an insight, a uh, first insight into my current practice and research. And if you would like to find out more, here are some links to my social media account, website and email address. So, yeah, please do get in touch. Thank you. Caroline, it's very uh, nice to see a section of your film, bits of your film, and I'm sure that uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be happy to have you back in February or March when you're back in the country to uh, have another in-person event and see the film properly and for you also to, to meet everyone here and to be introduced to the Centre for Print Research as well. Um, I will put the um, the the, v the Vimeo link. I, w I won't put the whole Vimeo into the um, into the recording. Maybe we do this for later. But uh, I'd like to ask uh, Susanna onto the stage as well at some point because Susanna is going to do some uh, some questions for you. Um, I have got a question which is about your 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 audio, your visual your work as a visual artist with that as and your work as a performance artist as well and the work that you're doing at the moment this seems like you're stepping back a bit from your uh, from your normal practice or if that's, that's what you could call a normal practice and you're letting other others perform for you so can you tell us a bit more about that how was that for you you mentioned patience already yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah um got challenged my patience but um yeah, so like you say, performances are quite um, important part of my practice, um, if not the main part of my practice. Um, but with this piece, I I had to step back, you know, and it, and film is still a quite unfamiliar medium for me. So I've never I've never worked with with proper film before. I have never had the experience of you know work with sound and kind of create a storyline, etc. So I have to confess that I was struggling a bit when it came to to build a plot or, you know, to kind of have a red thread through the film. And um, I was struggling to think about, do I, need, you know, do I need a voice? Do I need something, you know, a kind of narrative? 
um, how do the sounds work with the film. But in the end, it was just the visual material I've got was so incredible that I just wanted to let it speak for itself. Um, and me kind of stepping back and, and the insects, which are so often neglected, becoming the main kind of performers. And yeah. Uh, my last question before Susanna comes and joins us is what will you be making with your flax? We've got the winter months coming up now. You've got production. <laughs> did, you bring, did you take all your flax to Austria and have you got yes. there? What are you making with it? Yes, so I, I brought the whole harvest to Austria. Um, my dad um, picked me up by car, so we, we had the flax in the back of the car. Um, so I'm, I'm now in the process of further processing it, um, kind of, you know, going through all the processes I've mentioned, like breaking, sketching, heckling, etc. And then I'm going to uh, spin the flax by using a drop spindle, like one of these traditional hand spindles. And they will then be used in my weaving works. So weaving is quite an important part of my practice as well. Less the traditional weaving, um, which I've learned, but more the, the kind of symbolic act of weaving. So the kind of, in, in ancient mythology, weaving is often referred to the creation of time, where, you know, warp and weft, where time and space cross and create something new out of nothing. So, yeah, so loads to do, I think. <laughs> Fantastic. Looking forward to seeing that. Are there any questions in the room from anyone? Please step forward as well. If you if anybody in the room has got a question. I'm still waiting for we're still waiting for Susanna to come and join us. Susanna, are you there? Yeah, I thought you would ah, some in. <laughs> <laughs> so shall I take over? Yes, please. Okay, so first I have to say I went, um, the Disruptive Print Lab went to see Carolina's uh, film in Bridgewater and I can only recommend to see it, how it was presented in Bridgewater in a dark room on a big, big screen because it's very immersive and the interesting, one interesting bit was as well that before we saw the film, a whole school class went in to see the film and their reactions are quite interesting. Um, I think that the film Endling shows everyone that we as humans are not so important, that we are only a very small part of the whole biosystem. So I recommend to see the film maybe we can project it at the center on a big screen because i think that that makes a huge difference so when we we discussed with we were there for several hours i think four hours and we discussed with caroline carolina all the kinds of what does it mean as an artist to interact with the audience should there be a message yes or no so i would like to invite the audience to ask questions but I have a question as well. So, Caroline, you are sitting again in a lockdown mm -hmm. in Austria. So has the lockdown or this kind of forced non-activity or non-moving, has it influenced your work? Absolutely. Like um, when the first lockdown happened last year, I was in the process of finishing my, my degree in Bath. So, you know, I was I was locked up. I was... And, and, you know, it was a different lockdown than it is now compared in terms of, you know, the kind of the whole atmosphere. Um, but I think the lockdown had, you know, a, a few positive things as well. It kind of, like you say, it slowed down the perception. People had to stay at home. People, you know, had to go for their daily walk or they did go for their daily walk, kind of looking at the natural world in a different way, maybe. Um, certainly it did for me. Um, but I think, you know, I don't know if I ha have told you already, but I partly grew up on a farm when I was little. My dad inherited a farm. And um, so I've always had this very close connection to, to nature and to the animal world. So this was always the most wonderful playing ground for me. So during lockdown, I somehow started, you know, feeling like a child again, wandering through through landscapes and just looking very closely. and. Yeah, with a with a more intensified view, maybe. So, yeah, I certainly feel that there is a big, big shift, um, and you can even see it in contemporary arts. You know, so many artists kind of start working with the natural world, being inspired by the natural world. Um, so many community projects 
um, develop, which, you know, which is a very good thing, kind of community growing projects where people start growing their own food, their own um, plants for fiber, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is certainly a big shift and big movement. And I hope it will, yeah, this awareness will continue and become even more, more important. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I, I've just come back from Berlin and we talked to a gardener there and it was in so far very interesting because he said when you are a gardener in Berlin, you know, in public spaces, all you do is removing poo and rubbish, not yeah. more. And basically no one listens to recommendations what should be planted. And I was really surprised that the trees we met on a, on a big uh, park like space, the trees that were quite small, but they were actually 200 years old. But because they are planted in an urban environment, they can't grow because the, the roots can't go down. So I, you said already that you are hoping that people will look closer at nature or perhaps find the connection again to where stuff is coming from yeah um and now i know you are in austria and you have this this forest project where this ancient forest yeah is is cut down in the near future i mean tell us a little bit more about it or what what, what is your objective with this yeah. new project um just just one thing you mentioned the the school class that came in to see yeah. the show sits quite nicely here but i think you know with all these community projects it is that the children we have to address because the you know they are the next generation and if forming this awareness and this sensitivity from a very early age it can only be you know very positive in the future um so yeah my forest project so um this is only really in 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 a very you know, in the starting position, but it's basically a forest I, I know since childhood. And this forest is about to get deforested, so kind of cleared. Um, and I wish to incorporate people, Austrian artists, um, artists from the UK to kind of create a network and invite people to respond to the site and to respond, you know, to the forest. It's rather shocking. Um, you know, because there are quite rare moss and lichen species in the forest. And, you know, I simply can't understand how this is possible nowadays, you know, with with all the many discussions about climate change and, you know, and raising temperatures, how is this possible that a huge, huge ancient forest gets cleared? How? So I think art has the power to to translate scientific or more you know just more complex uh, knowledge into something very approachable um, uh, knowledge people can understand and people can associate with and people can feel you know art is so much about feeling and sensing and and, and intuition i think so yeah yeah i mean i'm not sure whether whether i'm with you with feeling and intuition i think art is a good yeah, it's good as explaining, and it certainly triggers thought. But I think it has. But I think then, yeah. you know, that's the discussion we had before. That you yeah, I know. how you interact with your. I audience. should not have gone down this lane. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> no, but I'm, I mean, just in terms of emotions, you know, like like these people, like like the school class who came to see the the work. You know, they experienced fear, they experienced anger because, you know, they they think snails are just slimy creatures or spiders are just bad. You know, but this is an alarm in my head. This is like, oh my God, you know, if people think insects are ugly and we have to kill them, I mean, oh, you know, this causes emotions within myself as well. So, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, Hello, thank, thank you. you. So I can see that that Frank has appeared again. <laughs> this is what a warning sign. <laughs> I, was, I thought I thought maybe I should just come in between you there before you start your argument there on stream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are friends, by the way. Yes, <laughs> we are all friends indeed. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, but it's a, it's a very good point that you also made in terms of the the political aspect of art, and you know, um, this happened in the as you know, we all know, it's happened in, in Germany in the 1960s and 70s as well, and the, a green movement came out of it. So, and it started with an artist doing that. So maybe that's where we where this can lead as well, possibly at some point. So, yeah. Anyway, I didn't want to sort of just completely interrupt, but I wanted to sort of wrap up, wrap up a little bit. So, I did you, <laughs> sorry, if you had any more questions, I didn't want to just stop your flow. I can hide. I think Sun and I have been going for a few more hours. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank, thank you, Susanna. Thank you for the questions uh, and uh, for, for leading the question answering session. I don't think there are any other questions um, from anybody who, uh, but if they do, please put them in the chat or just come and ask um, uh, and ask here in, in presence. Anyone else want to do? No, there's everybody here is happy. Mm -hmm. They've all had their lunch, they look very happy here. <laughs> entered um Wunjin's asked whether she can have the link on video for the uh, so Vimeo link whether we can oh, pass it on to to yeah. participants um, should I put my email address in the chat and they can email me directly and I can share that the that will be probably the best way so if you if you'd like to see the Vimeo uh, the video of the film um then please <laughs> contact Carolina uh, yourself but we will have another session uh, here live with Kalina in the in the CFPR uh, when she's back in um, in the UK and maybe we can have a proper good event here as well maybe at night time even because we can maybe project it outside it would be a nice way of uh, of integrating our gardens that we have here right here next door to to our W block here as well we do an outdoor screening for something like this this would be very nice oh, fantastic <laughs> okay well I just enough. Uh, finally, not to me to say thank you again, Caroline, Caroline, Carolina, uh, for showing us your work, uh, to giving thank us a you. taster, a taster of the film as well. There's lots of uh, thank yous in the in the chat as well. So um, Claire Schwartz is going to be in touch with you, just to warn you. Uh, <laughs> and um, yes, yeah, so I'd just like to thank everyone for coming to the seminar. Thank you for my to my crowd here in the background. Sophie is waving. Greetings well. from waving. <laughs> Look forward to for you to come out of um, out of lockdown back into the UK. Good luck yes. with all. Wishing you all the best um, for the season as well. And uh, finally, just for me to say thank you everyone for attending. Our next lunchtime seminar uh, will be uh, on the 8th of December um, with our own Laura Beth Corley. Uh, talking about um, her work in animation. So this will be also be uh, a live hybrid event here at the Center for Print Research at W Block. So anybody who uh, is here in person, please join us in person, but please join us in the normal uh, hybrid uh, virtual realm as well. Okay, so thank you very much uh, again and see you soon. So I'm gonna go back onto this um, uh, I go out of present mode and please feel free to chat around the tables as we exit now. Okay, bye bye. Thank you.